Stokes faced as a SpaceX and scraps a stainless steel rocket prototype, Rocket Lab is days away from debuting a new Electron variant, and SpaceX aces the 200th landing of a Falcon booster. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF. It's Friday the 16th of June, and there's much more to come this week in Spaceflight. Sponsored by Brilliant. Stoke Space shared some news this week about its engine and vehicle development for its upcoming fully reusable rocket. Stoke is working on a fully reusable rocket where the second stage will be able to not only go into orbit and deploy payloads, but also return back to a propulsive landing on the ground. Sound familiar? To that end, the company has spent the last few years developing the engine that will power the upper stage. The engine features 30 combustion chambers that surround a regeneratively cooled heat shield that is used for re-entry. This configuration makes the engine act as an aerospike in the vacuum of space, but also allows it to work well at sea level. Along with engine development, the company has also been building a prototype vehicle dubbed Hopper SN1, which was set to test fueling of the upper stage and demonstrate that the vehicle could launch and land, much like Starhopper and Grasshopper. Well, in a similar move to SpaceX, the company has decided to move on to its next test vehicle, Hopper SN2. Stokes' reason for moving on is that the team's uncovered issues during propellant tests. The vehicle is built using stainless steel, also like Starship, which allows the company to move quickly, and it says that the intention is to perform that long-awaited hop test at the end of summer. Of course, not everything is bad news for Stoke, as it also released footage of the company testing the upper stage's engine and its differential throttle capabilities. It's definitely an interesting approach to building a fully reusable rocket, and the company is making a lot of progress towards flying its first prototype hopper in the next few months. In the not-too-distant future, we might have not one, but two fully reusable rockets launching and landing routinely. It's time to return to a story that we've been following over the last few months. That is the sad tale of Virgin Orbit's bankruptcy. Branded as the world's most customizable launch service and able to launch what you want, when you want, and from literally anywhere you want, the service was unique. But as we all know, the company is no more. A few weeks back, the biggest acquisition, at least in terms of its identity, was revealed to the public. Stratolaunch purchased their 747 called Cosmic Girl. Obviously, with a change in ownership, it would mean a change in livery. And that process is now underway at the plane's base at Long Beach Airport. It's out with the red and in with the current trending color combination in aerospace, black and white. Now, if you didn't know, Cosmic Girl started its life as a standard 747 commercial airliner with Virgin Atlantic, ferrying customers for 14 years before being transferred to an American registration, and what was then the satellite launching arm of Virgin Galactic, which was spun off into Virgin Orbit. Conveniently, it meant that the red-purple gradient tail could be kept, as well as the red engines, saving money on paint. But according to Stratolaunch's render from the purchase announcement, it's a big S on the tail with black engines ready for its hypersonic testbed Talon A. Seeing the Virgin Orbit logo being removed from the side of Cosmic Girl does make the transfer feel more real. And it's a very bittersweet moment. A large proportion of our audience are from areas of the world that would have benefited from Virgin Orbit's future plan. But it's also the start of a new hypersonic era with Stratolaunch. And to rub more salt into the wound, Get ready for a new name and a new registration for Cosmic Girl. Remember the building that Rocket Lab bought because it was literally across the road from its existing Long Beach factory? Well, that's been unbranded as well. The Rocket Lab logo could be slapped on top here, or they could decide to leave it blank. Only time will tell. Okay, maybe we should talk about some rockets. On last week's episode, we talked about ULA's Vulcan successfully completing its flight readiness firing. This week, the company CEO, Tori Bruno, shared a couple of updates about Vulcan's path to launch. To give a bit of background, in case you don't remember, back in March of this year, ULA had an anomaly on the test stand while performing structural testing on a Centaur 5 stage. For this test, the vehicle was loaded with liquid nitrogen in the oxygen tank and with actual liquid hydrogen in the hydrogen tank. However, a hydrogen leak eventually developed and caught fire, which caused an explosion and fire on the test stand. 
The investigation into this issue had been ongoing since then, and it's been a pacing item to get Vulcan off the pad, something we had mentioned already last week. As you can imagine, the investigation had to figure out whether this anomaly occurred due to ground support equipment failure or due to a vehicle failure. Well, Tori Bruno confirmed this week that the investigation has concluded, and it turns out it was the Centaur after all. It seems like they might need to make the top dome of the stage just a little bit thicker to support the loads that they were testing at that test stand. This puts into question Vulcan's schedule, because Tori also mentioned that the company is working on a corrective action and will retest it. So does that mean we'll have to wait for ULA to make a whole new centaur with the fix in place and put it on the stand and then make sure the issue doesn't happen again? Could ULA just bring a centaur that's already in production, put some sort of add-on fix that solves the issue and allows ULA to test this quickly? What about the Vulcan that's slated to fly on the first flight? That one has a centaur on top, so what's gonna happen on that one? Well, the answer to all this, well, Tori says, quote, working on all of that now. So what do you guys think? Will we see a launch of Vulcan in the next few months, or will we have to wait much longer than that? As always, we want to know what you think in the comments down below. Up next, we'll be looking at the launches this week, including two record launches. But before that, I'll throw it off to Sawyer for a message about today's sponsor. Thanks, Alicia. But it's not just me, actually. I have my cat, Jake, over there in the corner. See? He's hanging out. The reason I pointed him out is because last time he made an appearance on NSF Live and everybody wanted him to replace me as the commentator. So I figured, you know what? Let's get him prepped and ready. And the best way I could think of was with today's sponsor, Brilliant. My cat is really smart, but he's not great with math problems, scientific data, things like that. Or speaking for that matter, Brilliant.org can help. At least with the first two. Not only have we been doing the lessons interactively online, we've also been taking some of them and trying them in the real world. For example, momentum. And of course, a cat's favorite, gravity. And you don't even have to have a cat to enjoy one of the thousands of lessons they have available. You can get a 30-day free trial by going to brilliant.org slash NASA spaceflight or clicking the link in the description below. And the first 200 of you humans also get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Now, if you don't mind, Jake and I have some cuddling and learning to do. Alicia, back to you. Hey, I'm feline smarter already. Now, let's go over this week in launches. This week, we had a Falcon 9 launch carrying the latest batch of Starlink V1.5 satellites as part of the Starlink Group 511 mission. Liftoff occurred on June 12th at 710 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. The booster, B-1073, was flying for a ninth time, and it landed successfully on SpaceX's drone ship Just Read the Instructions. The satellites were deployed successfully, adding 52 more Starlink satellites launched, bringing that total to 4,595 satellites. Of these, 4,267 still remain in orbit, while 3,622 are now in their operational orbit. From the other side of the world, we had a Chongzheng 2D rocket carrying 41 Jilin-1 satellites into sun-synchronous orbit. Liftoff occurred on June 15th at 5.30 UTC from Launch Complex 9 at the Taiyarn Satellite Launch Center in China. The Jilin-1 satellites are commercial Earth observation satellites developed and operated by the Chongchun Institute of Optics, Fine Mechanics, and Physics of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. For this mission, the Chongzheng 2D's fairing was packed with 41 of these satellites, marking a record for most satellites carried ever on a single Chinese rocket. For reference, the current worldwide record was set in January 2021 by SpaceX on their first SmallSat rideshare mission, Transporter 1. And speaking of SpaceX's transporter missions, this week we also had the launch of SpaceX's eighth transporter mission, and it featured an impressive milestone, the 200th landing of a Falcon booster. Liftoff of the Falcon 9 took place on June 12th at 2135 UTC from Space Launch Complex 4 East in Vandenberg. The mission was carrying 72 payloads into a sun-synchronous orbit. Among these payloads was Rocket Lab's first photon satellite that wasn't launching on an electron rocket. This photon satellite, named W-Series-1, is being used to host Varda Space's in-space manufacturing platform and re-entry capsule. The company's goal is to use this kind of platform to manufacture certain materials and pharmaceutical products in the microgravity environment of space to then return them back to Earth for recovery and commercialization. To give a quick rundown of other folks riding on board, there were also satellites and orbital platforms from companies like Launcher, D-Orbit, 
Maverick Space Systems, Alba Orbital, and even some satellites from Swarm Technologies, which, if you remember, is now a subsidiary of SpaceX. So I guess in some sense, SpaceX satellites were also riding on this mission. Of course, going in-depth into all of the payloads would take a whole nother video, but you can find a lot more about them in our mission article written by NSF's Danny Lentz to learn all about those payloads riding inside of the fairing. It's always really hard to find all of the small sats since there's so many of them flying, and Danny had to make quite an effort to try and track all of them down, so definitely check it out. But as you know by now, the star of the show during that launch was the landing of the first stage of the Falcon 9. B-1071, which was flying for a ninth time, successfully landed at SpaceX's landing zone 4, just 400 meters to the west of the launch mount. This would be just another routine landing like all the others if it weren't for it being the impressive and mind-blowing 200th landing of a Falcon booster. Development of Falcon 9's propulsive booster landing began all the way back in 2011, and since then, the company has tried to bring a booster to a soft landing for recovery 211 times. Of all those attempts, only 11 landing attempts have failed, with two of those being before the first successful landing. It kind of feels like there were more, but if you doubt me, I can list them. The first two were CRS-5 and 6, both of those being the two attempts prior to the first successful landing, then Jason-3, that poor landing leg, after that was SES-9, and then abs Utilsat. Then the next one after that didn't happen for quite some time until Falcon Heavy's center core, which wasn't able to land on the drone ship. Then came the failure on Sierra 16, which ironically ended up on a successful recovery. Then we had the center core for STP-2. And in 2020, we lost two boosters on Starlink missions, one due to erroneous wind data, and the other featured the second in-flight failure of a Merlin engine. And the latest, and most funny one, was during the Starlink V1.0-19 mission with the famous drone ship Seagulls. While Transporter 8's landing was the 200th successful attempt, it also marked the 126th landing in a row since the last landing failure. Since then, there haven't been any unsuccessful landing attempts. The streak of landing success is longer than even the streak of successful launches of any other rocket out there, except of course, Falcon 9 itself, which has achieved over 200 successful launches in a row. Historically reliable vehicles such as the Delta II and the Ariane 5 aren't even close. There's no doubt that Falcon 9 has become SpaceX's reliable workhorse. It's demonstrated an incredible reliability to perform launches, entries, and landings. The numbers show it, and frankly, well, here's hoping we get to see another 200 Falcon landings. Before we dive into what to look for next week, I feel like we have to mention an upcoming launch that, while not orbital, is quite interesting. And that is Rocket Lab's first launch of Haste. This week's episode feels like a throwback to many of our prior episodes, but trust me here, we've also talked about Haste. It was on our first episode. It stands for Hypersonic Accelerator Suborbital Test Electron, and in simple terms, it's just an electron rocket that flies in a suborbital trajectory to test customer payloads at hypersonic speeds. Since it doesn't need to go into orbit, Electron can carry a larger payload than usual and just accelerate it to hypersonic speeds. This was announced just two months ago, and the company already had an Electron under preparation at Wallops in Virginia to support the first haste flight. This week, we saw the release of Temporary Flight Restrictions, or TFRs, for this flight, along with a note on the FAA's current operations plan advisory showing the launch dates and window. The mission, dubbed on this paperwork as Dynamo A, could launch as early as June 18th during a 3-hour, 45-minute window that opens at 045 UTC. For the moment, there's only one TFR for that first attempt, but it's likely that more will pop up in the next few days if they're needed in case of a delay. It also appears the company is not planning on live streaming the launch, and the Wallops flight facility has announced that it doesn't plan on opening access to viewing areas. So as you can see, while technically a suborbital launch, it's quite a new development for Electron and it feels very secretive. No announcement from Rocket Lab, no live stream, no access to the viewing areas inside of the center? Mm. <laughs> well, I guess we're gonna have to wait and see if we ever find out. And now let's go over a very busy next week in spaceflight. A Falcon 9 is set to launch the Satria satellite for Pacific Satellite Nusantara from Florida. The launch is scheduled to occur within a 3 hour 28 minute window that opens on June 18th at 2204 UTC. The Bepi Colombo probe, 
a mission from the European Space Agency and the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, is set to perform a flyby of Mercury this week. Closest approach should happen on June 19th at 1934 UTC, with the probe flying just 240 kilometers from the surface of Mercury. This is the third of six Mercury flybys that the probe will perform before entering orbit around the planet in 2025. Just like with Rocket Lab's haste launch, China plans a launch of a Chongzheng 6 rocket, but we're not sure what it will launch. We do know that liftoff is currently set to occur on June 20th within a 42-minute window that opens at 3.11 UTC from the Taiyarn Satellite Launch Center. Mystery payload for now, but we'll probably know more after the launch, so come back to next week's episode to find out. From mystery payload to classified payload. A Delta IV Heavy is set to launch the NROL-68 mission on June 21st at 7.29 UTC from Florida. This will be the penultimate launch of the Flamey Hydrolox Orange Rocket. Another Starlink mission is also on tap for next week, with Starlink Group 57 currently eyeing a launch in the very early morning of June 22nd from Vandenberg. This will be SpaceX's first launch in support of Starlink's second-generation constellation from the West Coast. Russian cosmonauts Sergei Prokopiev and Dmitry Patelin will perform a spacewalk on June 22nd to remove experiments from the outside of the ISS and activate Naoka's new airlock. The spacewalk is planned to begin at around 1420 UTC. And an honorable mention is the last launch of Ariane 5, which had been scheduled for June 16th, so the day we're releasing this episode, but had to be postponed right before rollout of the rocket. It appears that Ariane 5 is not wanting to retire just yet. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news! Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Remember to get your 30-day free trial and 20% off your annual subscription by going to brilliant.org slash NASA Spaceflight or clicking on the link in the description. And hey, if you like this video, make sure to like and subscribe. And you might want to watch our latest Battle of the Lunar Landers video by Adrian, which should be over here. Or if you're more of a Starship fan, you can get the latest on it with this other video. All right, everyone, so we'll see you all again next week to recap this week in spaceflight.